Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Mobile World Congress 2017. Brought to you by Intel. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Palo Alto for day two of two days of Mobile World Congress special coverage here in Palo Alto. We're bringing all the folks in Silicon Valley here in the studio to analyze all the news and commentary of which we've been watching heavily on the ground in Barcelona. We have reporters, we have analysts, and we have friends there. Of course, Intel is there as well as SAP and a variety of other companies we've been talking to on the phone. And all those, those interviews are on youtube.com slash siliconangle. And uh, we're here with uh, Chuck Tato, who's the marketing director of the Data Center Communications Group at Intel around the FPGA, which is the programmable chips, formerly with the Altera Group, now part of Intel. Welcome to theCUBE, and thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So obviously all the rage at Mobile World Congress, Intel, big splash, um, and you guys have been, I mean, Intel's always been the bellwether. I was saying this earlier, Intel uh, plays the long game. You have to in the chips games. You got to build the factories, <laughs> build the fabs. Moore's Law has been, been the, the, the heartbeat of the industry. But now, doing more with less chips, <laughs> Moore's Law, make it smaller, faster, cheaper, uh, or less expensive, and just more, more power, and the cloud does that. So you're in the cloud data center group. Um, take a second to talk about what you guys do within Intel, and, and why that's important uh, for folks to understand. Sure, um, I'm part of the um, Programmable Solutions Group. So the Programmable Solutions Group uh, primarily focuses on uh, field programmable gate array technology. That, that was acquired uh, through the Altera acquisition at Intel. So our focus in, in my particular group is around data center and comms infrastructure. Uh, so, so there what we're doing is we're, we're taking the, uh, the FPGAs and we're applying them to uh, the data center as well as carrier infrastructure to accelerate things, make them faster, make them more repeatable or more uh, deterministic uh, in nature. And so the, how it works, as you were explaining before, you can set a stream of bits at it and it changes the functionality of the chip. Yes, so, so essentially um, an FPGA, think of it as a, a malleable set of resources. Uh, when I say that, uh, you know, you can create, it's, it's basically a fabric with uh, many resources in an array. So, so through the use of a bit stream, you can actually program that, that fabric to interconnect the, the different elements of the chip uh, to create any function that you would like for the most part. Uh, so think of it as you can create a switch, you can create a classification engine, things like that. And why would someone want, want that functionality versus just a purpose-built chip? Uh, perfect question. <laughs> um, so, so if you look at there, there's two areas. So, in, in the data center as well as in carrier infrastructure, um, the workloads are changing constantly, uh, and there's there's two problems. Number one, you could create infrastructure that becomes stranded. You know, so you, you think you're going to have so much traffic of a certain type, and you don't. So, you end up buying a lot of purpose-built equipment that's just wrong for what you need going forward. So by building uh, infrastructure that is common, so kind of COTS you know, on, yeah. on servers, uh, but adding FPGAs to the mix allows you to reconfigure the networking within the, the, the cloud uh, to allow you to, to address workloads that you care about at any given time. So adaptability seems to be the key thing. You know kind of trends based on certain things. So certainly the first time you see things, you got to figure it out. But this gives a lot of flexibility, it sounds like. Uh, exactly, adaptability is the key, uh, and and as well as bandwidth and determinism, yeah. right? So, so when you get a high bandwidth coming into the network, and you want to do something very rapidly and consistently, uh, to provide a certain service level agreement, uh, you, you need to have circuits that are actually very, very deterministic in, in nature. Chuck, I want to get your thoughts on one of the, the key things I talked with Sandra Reddy, I'm uh, Sandra Rivera, sorry, uh -huh. she was uh, I interviewed her this morning as well as uh, Dan Rodriguez and Caroline Chan, um, Lynn Kahn as well, mm -hmm. a lot of different perspectives. Obviously 5G is big on one hand, had the devices out there announcing on Sunday. Yeah. But what was missing, and I think Fortune was the really the only one I saw pick up on this besides Silicon Angle in terms of the coverage was, there's a real end-to-end -end, um, discussion here mm -hmm. around not just the 5G as the connectivity piece that the carriers care about, but there's the under the hood work mm -hmm. <laughs> that's changing in the data center, uh, and the car's a data center now, right? So yeah. you have all these new things happening, IOT, people with sensors on them and devices, uh, and then you get the cloud-ready compute available, right? Mm -hmm. And we love what's happening with cloud. Infinite compute is, is there and makes data work much better. How does um, the end-to-end -end story with Intel and the group that you're in impact that end-to-end? -end? And, and, and what are the, some of the use cases that seem to be popping up in that area? 
Okay, so uh, it's a, a great question. And, and I guess uh, some of the examples that I could give of where we're creating end-to-end -end solutions would be in wireless infrastructure, as you just mentioned. Uh, as you, you move on to 5G infrastructure, the goal is to increase the bandwidth by 100x and reduce the latency by orders of magnitude. It's a very, very significant challenge. Uh, to do that is quite difficult to do it just in software. Uh, FPGA is a perfect complement to a software-based solution to, to achieve these goals. For example, virtual switching, it's a significant load on the processors. By, by offloading virtual switching in an FPGA, you can create the virtual switch that you need for the particular workload that you need. Uh, workloads change depending on what type of services you're offering in a given area, so you can tailor it to exactly what you need. You may or may not need high levels of security, so things like IPsec uh, you know, at, at full line rate are the kind of things that FPGAs allow you to add ad hoc. You can add them where you need them, when you need them, uh, and change them as the, as the services change. So it sounds like, I never thought about that, but it sounds like this is a real architectural advantage because I never thought about offloading the processor, and we all know we've all opened up and built our own PCs, know that the heat sinks only get bigger and bigger. Right? Yeah. So the, and if people want that horsepower, uh, for very processor intensive things. Absolutely, so we do two things. Um, one is we do create this flexible infrastructure. The second thing is we, we offload the processor for things that you know, free up cores to do more value added things. Like I'll, gaming I'll for the, my, my kids love to see that yes. gaming. <laughs> yes, gaming, virtual reality, <laughs> augmented virtual reality, all of those yeah. things are very CPU intensive, but there's also a compute intensive aspect. Okay, so I got to get your take on this, because this is kind of a cool conversation, because that's the virtual reality and augmented reality really are relevant. That is a key part of uh, Mobile World Congress. Um, so that's the IoT, which I think is the biggest story this year is IoT and all the security aspects of it uh, mm -hmm. around it and all that good stuff. And that's really where the meat is. But the real sex appeal is the virtual reality and the more augmented reality. That's an example of new things that have popped out of the woodwork. So the question for you is, um, for all these new use cases that are going to emerge, there will be new things that are going to pop out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I want to write software for that. There's an app for that now. So the new apps are going to start coming in, whether it's something new and cool on a car, something new and cool on a sensor, something new and cool in the data center. How uh, adaptive are you guys and how do you guys fit into that kind of preparing for this unknown future? Well, that's a that's a great question too. Um, I like to think about new services coming coming forward as uh, being a unique blend of uh, storage, compute, and networking. And depending on the application and the and the moment in that application, you may have to change that mix in a very flexible way. So again, the the FPGA provides you the ability to to change all of those uh, to match the application needs. I'm surprised as we dig into applications, you know, how many different sets of needs there are. So each time you do that, you can envision uh, reprogramming your FPGA. So just like a processor, it's it's completely reprogrammable. You're not going to reprogram it in the same instantaneous way that you do in software, but you can reprogram it on the fly whenever you would like. So I'm kind of a neophyte in this here, so I want to ask some dumb questions. Uh, sure. um, probably be dumb to you, but. Uh, um, comment to me, but would be like, okay, who writes the bits? Is it uh, the coders or is it someone on the firmware side? I'm trying to understand where the line is between that hardened top of mm -hmm. kind of Intel goodness that goes on algorithmically or automatically or um, what programmers do. So think full stack developer or a composer, a more artisan type who's maybe writing an app. Um, are there both access points to the coding or is it Where's the coding come from? So there's multiple uh, multiple ways that this is happening. I mean, the the uh, the traditional way of programming an FPGA is the same way that you would design any ASIC in the industry, right? Somebody sits down and they write RTL. They're very specialized right. programmers. Um, however, going forward, uh, there's multiple ways you can access it. For one, we're creating libraries of solutions that you can access through APIs that are um, built into DPDK, for example, on, on Xeon. So you can very mm -hmm. easily access uh, accelerated applications and inline applications that are being developed by ourselves as well as third parties. So there's a, a rich ecosystem. So you guys are writing hooks to go beyond being the ASIC special type specialist programmer. Uh, absolutely. So, so this makes it uh, very accessible to programmers. They, the acceleration that's there from a um, library and purpose Give an built. example if you can. Uh, sure, a virtual switch. So we're in, in our platform for NFE, we're, we're building in a virtual switch solution, uh, and you can you can program that just like you you know in, in, totally in software through DPDK. Um, one of the things coming up with NFE that's interesting. I don't know if this is your wheelhouse or not, but I want to throw it out there because it's come up in multiple interviews and in the industry. You're seeing um, very cool ideas and solutions roll out. I'll give you know just I'll make one up. Pop, pop in my head. Oh, OpenStack, right? OpenStack is a great, great uh, vision. 
but it's you know there's a lot of fumbling in the execution of it, and this cost of ownership goes through the roof because there's a lot of operation on overgeneralizing certain use cases, not all yeah. open stack. But in generally speaking, uh, Hadoop had the same problem with big data, where great solution, uh -huh. but when you lay out the architect and then deploy it, yeah. there's a lot of cost of ownership overhead in terms of uh, resources. Um, so is this kind of an area that you guys can help simplify? Because that seems to be a sticking point for people who want to stand up some infrastructure and do DevOps and then get into this API-like framework. Yeah, so from a, from a hardware perspective, um, we are actually creating a platform which includes a lot of software to tie into OpenStack. So that's all pre-integrated for you, if you will. So, so at least from a, a hardware interface perspective, yeah. I can say that that part of the equation gets neutralized. Uh, in terms of the rest of the ownership part, I'm not, I'm not really qual <laughs> qualified to, to, to answer that question. That's a good, it's good media training right there. Yeah. Uh, Chuck just came back from Intel media training, which is, which is good, we, get, we got you fresh. Um, network transformation, NFV also points mm -hmm. to some really cool, exciting areas that are going on that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, at the network layer, you see uh, NFE and SDN, for instance, as mm -hmm. really important areas that people are innovating on. And they're super important because, again, this is where the action is. You have virtualization, you have new capabilities, you got some security things going down the lower end of the stack. How, what's the impact there from an Intel perspective, helping this end-to-end -end, end -end architecture be seamless? Sure, uh, so what, what we are doing right now is creating a, a, a layer uh, on top of our FPGA-based uh, SmartNIC solutions, which ties together um, all of that into a single platform, and it cuts across multiple Intel products. Uh, we have you know, Xeon processors integrated with FPGAs. We have discrete FPGAs built on to, to cards uh, that, that we are in the process of, of developing. Um, so, so from a smart NIC through to a fully integrated FPGA plus Xeon processor, it's one common framework, one common way of programming the FPGA, so IP can move from one to the other. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, very neat uh, end-to-end -end and, and uh, seamless uh, capabilities. So final question is the customer environment. Obviously you guys um, have a lot of customers out there. Mm -hmm. um, the edge computing is a huge thing right now. We're seeing that as a big part of this, uh, kind of the clarity coming out of Mobile World Congress, at least from the telco standpoint, it's mm -hmm. kind of not new in the data center area. You know, the edge, edge now is redefined certainly with IoT yes. and IoTP, which we're calling IoTP for people having devices. Um, what are the customer challenges right now that you guys are addressing, and, and specifically, what's the pain points, and what's the current state of the art relative to the customer's expectations now that they're focused on that you guys are solving? Yeah, that's that's a great question too. We we have a lot of customers now that are are taking. Um, transmission equipment, for example, mobile backhaul types of equipment, and they want to add mobile edge computing and NFV type capabilities to that equipment. Uh, the beauty of what we're doing is the, the same solution that we have for the cloud works just as well in that same piece of equipment. FPGAs come in all different sizes, so you can fit within your power envelope. Our processors come in all different sizes. So you can you can tailor your solution. And then That's you super can important on the telco software. side. I mean, power, is huge. Yes, yes, and, and FPJs allow you to to tailor the power equation as much as possible. Right? So the question on begs the next question is: Are you does this make it cloud ready? Because that's been a term that we've hearing a lot of um, cloud ready. Because that sounds like what you're offering is the ability to kind of tie into the same stuff that the cloud has or the data yes. center. It, it, exactly. In fact, um, you know, there's been been very uh, high profile uh, press around uh, the use of FPGAs in, in cloud infrastructure. So we're seeing a huge uptick there. So it is uh, getting cloud ready. I yeah. wouldn't say it's, it's perfectly there, but we're, we're getting very Well, close. the thing that's exciting to me, I think is cloud, the cloud native movement is really talks about, again, you know, these abstractions that are with microservices and you mentioned APIs, really fits well into some of the agileness that needs to happen at the network layer to be more dynamic. I mean, just think about the provisioning of uh, IOT. Yeah. I mean, I'm a telco, I got to provision a phone. That's, get a phone number, connect to the network, and then have sessions go to the, the base station, and then back to the, the cloud. Imagine having to provision up and down zillions of times these devices that may get provisioned once and go away in an hour. Right. That's still challenging, you need a network fabric. Yes, it, it is going to be a challenge, but I mean, I think as, as common as we can make the physical infrastructure, uh, the better and the easier that's yeah. going to be, and as we create more common. Chuck, power. final question, um, what's your take from Mobile World Congress? What are you hearing, what's your analysis, commentary, any kind of input you've heard? Obviously Intel's got a big presence there. Uh, your thoughts on what's happening at Mobile World Congress? Um, 
Well, see, I'm not at Mobile World Congress. I'm, I'm here in Silicon <laughs> Valley right now. But uh, what have you heard? But th things are very exciting. I've been, I'm mostly focused on the on the NFE world myself, and yeah. there's been just lots and lots of uh, it's been high profile. Uh, yes, and, and there's been lots of activity, and you know we've been doing demos and and really cool stuff in that area. Uh, we haven't announced much of that on the FPGA side, but uh, I think you'll be seeing more. But you're involved. So what's, what's yes. the coolest thing that NFE that you're seeing? Because it seems to be crunch time for NFE right now. This is a catalyst point yeah. where, at least from my covering NFV and looking at it, the, the iterations of it, it's prime time right now for NFV, true? Yeah, it's it's perfect timing, and it's actually perfect timing for FPGAs. I'm not trying just trying to give it a plug. Yeah. Um, when you look at it, trials have gone on very significant. Lots of learnings from those trials, uh, and what we've done is we've identified the bottlenecks, and and my group has been working very hard to uh, resolve those bottlenecks so it can scale and roll out in, in the next couple of years and be ready for 5G when it comes. Software-defined Chuck Dato here from Intel inside the cube, breaking down the coverage from Mobile World Congress as we wind down our day in California. The folks in Spain are just going out. It should be like. 12 o'clock at night there, uh, or going to bed, depending on how beat they are. It's again, in Barcelona, Spain is where it's at. We're covering from here, and I'll also talking to folks in Barcelona. We'll have more commentary here in Silicon Valley on Mobile World Congress after this short break.